So aside from Weintraub and Gray, most of your experience has been running your own agency. Yes, it has. And uh, I have felt in the many years that have passed that perhaps that was a great advantage. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, story told about Mr. Ross, the original editor of the New Yorker, the famous editor. And I think it was Thurber who said about him, he was such a great editor because his mind was uncluttered by culture. <laughs> Perhaps my mind was uncluttered by the conventional knowledge about advertising, and I was able to go at some new and fresh points of view. You hadn't picked up any bad habits, is that it? No, I hadn't. Well, tell me, you started the agency in, 19, in 1949. 49. When did you begin to feel that the agency was a success? Well, I really began to feel that after, you know, our first account was Orbax. Right. And uh, after we ran our first Orbax campaign, uh, the phone began to ring. And I have learned that uh, what you think is going to happen doesn't matter too much. It's what happens that counts. And when I began to see the concrete reaction to some of the Orbax ads with the phone ringing, and several new accounts coming immediately after that campaign, I just felt I had the right to feel that perhaps we were going to make it. What qualities do you look for in creative people? Well, mostly in creative people, I look for a deep insight into human nature because I think the real basis for persuasion is to understand what motivates a man. As a matter of fact, John, I, uh, I had put down, I recently delivered a lecture in one of the universities, and I had put down some words about that very subject. I wonder if I could just sure. uh, uh, read them to you. Uh, what I had said was that uh, the writer is concerned with what he puts into his writing. The communicator is concerned not just with what he puts into a piece of writing, but with what the reader gets out of it. He therefore becomes a student of how people read and how they listen. He learns that most readers come away from their reading not with a clear, precise, detailed registration of its contents on their minds, but rather with a vague, misty idea which was formed as much by the pace and the proportions and the music of the writing as by the literal words themselves. And he learns that the reader reads with his ego, his emotions, with his compulsions, his prejudices, his urges and his aspirations, and that he plots with his brain to rationalize the facts until they become the tools of his desire. The human being is uh, created by nature, really, and there are certain instincts we have which really dominate. And unless we understand that, if we proceed purely on an intellectual basis, we're not going to get very far. There, there was a pretty... Uh, intelligent salesman by the name of Aristotle a long time ago who said that uh, you don't persuade people through the intellect you do it through the passions now it's up to the man who's doing the, the persuading to tap those passions for good moral purposes but certainly that's what does it I think it was uh, a Conrad who said you can have all the precise words in the world just give me the words like glory and honor and all the words of emotion and inspiration. I'm going to come back to that later. Let me ask you, where do you look for creative people? Where do you find them? Well, if I had only one word to answer that question with, it would be anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. You know, we, uh, uh, all I want is the talent. And fortunately, uh, being in the creative end of the business myself, I think I can spot the talent. But it's the talent that you cannot teach. I can hmm. teach advertising. Hmm. That's why I think it's so wrong very often to just look for a man who's had great experience in such and such an area. As a matter of fact, there might be a great handicap because that man may come in and do things as they were always done. And if you do things the way they were always done, you're not going to be very effective because the essence of impact is saying things the way they were never said before. Let me ask you, I have the impression that most of the creative talent at Doyle Dame Birnbeck is homegrown, that you've hired young people and trained them. Is that right? That's precisely what happened. Uh, I have uh, several great uh, creative people who came from the most unlikely places in the world. One came to me originally from a place called Broadway Maintenance with a dog-eared little folder he had done 
but I spotted a freshness in his putting together of words and his concepts. He became Bob Levinson, who was one of the great creative directors. I took Phyllis Robinson, who was our first copy chief, out of the promotion department of an agency, and she wasn't considered good enough at that time to be in the national department. I know of no one who's better than Phyllis Robinson. We don't have the proper standards in picking our creative people. We have to go by symbols, and you know symbols can get you in trouble. I love to tell that story, a uh, uh, true story. It appeared in Science Magazine about this great experiment when eight very, very intelligent uh, men were put into, a, into several uh, mental institutions. They were very sane men, but the experiment called for putting them down as schizophrenics. And the purpose of the experiment was to find out how long it would take the staff to discover that they were normal people. <laughs> well, you know, it wasn't long before the real inmates of the Institute suspected that these were real sane people. But the doctors, during the entire stay of these normal people, never suspected. Now, what happened there was that word schizophrenics became a symbol. They're conditioned. And the they were conditioned, conditioned by the word. So you have to be very careful about the Let me ask you a question. Is academic background important in creative people? No. I think uh, it's a help, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's fine. I don't think that you teach art. I don't think that you teach persuasion. I think all you can teach is knowledge. Mm. And knowledge, you have to be concerned with. Knowledge is a great thing to have. But knowledge per se means that that knowledge already exists. And in that sense, it's the past. Mm. The only thing that can take you from knowledge into the future is an idea. All right, then let me ask you, does the creative atmosphere of Doyle Dane Birnbach transplant? I don't think the environment transplant because the environment is people. And uh, if they took all of us with the man they hire, it would transplant. But uh, I have seen some of our good people leave and not do the same quality work that they've done while they were with us. There's uh, a relationship between uh, the management with the creative management, indeed between the t whole management and the creative person that just can't be ignored. If a man uh, feels inspired, if he's uh, been given good guidance, if he's been given fundamentals, you see, you can have great talent and do poor advertising. Without the discipline. Without the discipline. And I think one of the contributions a great management can make creatively is to put down the tracks for a creative man to follow. But at the same time, he must understand the problems of the creative man. Because if he doesn't, the creative man will not respect him and therefore not accept the guidance. Mm. I think the man who's doing the guiding must be able to do the creative work himself.